from the Living Faith Christian Church. As you can see, we're finally into Christmas season here. We're excited to have you with us. Please stand, let's worship the Lord together.
Everyone, please be seated. My name is Manny Fernandez, and I'm actually the student director here at Living Faith. And if this is your first time here, I want to give you a warm welcome and hope that you enjoy today's service. On December 15th, we're going to have a cozy Christmas event. If you have kids at the age of three up to fifth grade, we want to welcome you and enjoy this event and be able to share less than memories with your family. However, the registration deadline will be December 8th. Also, for next week, December 10th, come celebrate as we wish Pastor Mark and Lynn for the farewell celebration. They have made not only an impact within this church, but within the community. I know there's many stories Pastor Mark would tell me about him and his wife will go around door to door, hand out cookies and potato chips, whatever it is, just to advance the gospel to them, just to show the love, not only with him in the community, but the love that Jesus has for each and every one to share the good news. Also, I want to invite you guys for December 21st, where we're going to have the Christmas worship event at 7 p.m. I can't think of any other way or better way to actually celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and worship him before the weekend of the Christmas. And with that, I just want to ask if you guys would bow your heads in a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to worship you freely, Lord. Lord, we ask that whatever's going on in our lives right now, that you just calm it down. Whatever noise, distractions, whatever we have, we just leave it at your feet, Lord. That you open our eyes and our ears to your word, to the truth, and our heart to you. We just submit because we can't do it alone. We try, we just make a mess out of it. But with you, all things are possible. And you remind us that through your word. Lord, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you for the Korean pregnancy ministry that you have given us in Puerto Rico, Lord, and the hundreds of babies that have been saved because of the work that you are doing there, Lord. And praise you, Lord, that there's going to be another ministry that's opening up, and we know that you're going to work in your mighty hands in that ministry and be able to save even more lives. Lord, we also thank you for the hostages that were released, Lord, and back with their families right now in the Middle East, Lord. And we thank you for that. And we know that there's still terrible times going on in this world, but we also know that you're still on the throne and that you're still working, Lord, and we see that happen. And Lord, we also come to you, Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity and what you have done for us on the cross that we don't deserve anything. We deserve nothing. But the love that you have shown, that unconditional love that you have shown us on the cross, seeing that how sinful we are and yet you're still died for us, pain of fine we can never, ever pay, but you did it for us. So for those who just submit themselves and choose you, Lord, and be like, I need you, that you will give us eternity, an eternal place with you, and exemplify what love should be, what it should look like, Lord. And Lord, I come to you for this whole room, everyone in this room, Lord, that they may be able to hear your word today, as Pastor Scott will preach, Lord, and that you would touch everyone's heart here and recognize that we do need you in our lives, not just for today and tomorrow, but every day until we meet, Lord. We pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. Everyone says amen. Amen. Uh, before we continue to worship, I just want to um, echo Manny's sentiment that I invite you, please be here next Sunday night uh, to celebrate Pastor Mark and Lynn's ministry here at Living Faith. I know Manny didn't say, but it's also had such a positive impact on us on a, as a staff and the way Pastor Mark has continually kept us focused on the Lord's mission to reach people for Christ and his heart for that has now bled throughout the staff and is, and is an important part of our culture on our staff here at Living Faith too. So please be here so we can bid them farewell, but celebrate them and all the ministry that they've done and all that God has done through both of them when they're here. So please be, do that next week. And right now, please stand. We're going to continue to worship together. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. 
Lord God, we come before you and worship the light of the world. And Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor. And we celebrate all the things that you've done. And Lord, as we enter into this Christmas season, Lord, we're so thankful that we can also celebrate the perfect gift of our Savior, of your Son, Jesus Christ. As we just sang, you have come for us, this Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for coming for us to save us because we need you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you are our source of love and that you are our source of peace and that you are our source of joy. So we ask that you would help us to remember that as we go through this season as well, Lord God. And we pray now, Lord, that you continue to work in our hearts, clear our hearts and our minds to hear from you. Speak to us now through your word, we pray, and speak to us through Pastor Scott as he delivers your message to us today. We thank you, Lord, and we give you glory, this Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Merry Christmas. I'm just going to say that every week until it happens. It's enjoyable, isn't it, to come to church and 
celebrate who God is for us in Jesus and to have decor that lifts our spirit even. So grateful you're here. So grateful to be with you. A little girl who grew up in an atheistic home where there was no mention of God uh, whatsoever at any time asked her dad about the origin of the world. Imagine that conversation. It's actually a true story. She said, Daddy, where'd all this come from? Where'd all this come from? Basically, one of the hardest questions there is. Little girl asked. And her father replied, you know, with an extended discourse about everything in the world. But never said anything supernatural. It was all about the natural world. He went on and on and on. And then at the end, he added, however, there are those who say that all of this comes from a very powerful being, and they call him God. We call him Jesus, right? At this point, the little girl began to run around like a whirlwind in a burst of joy throughout the room, and she exclaimed, I knew what you told me wasn't true. It is him. It is him. It is him. See, the truth about God is properly basic to the human soul. It must be suppressed to be disbelieved. Everybody knows in their heart that God is real. And even more, the reality of God, particularly all that God is for us in Jesus, is meant to give us great joy, like that little girl. Now, I'm not going to invite you to get up from your seat right now and run around in a whirlwind in the room, exclaiming, it is him, it is him, it is him. But perhaps you could do that in your heart. I want to encourage you today to rejoice in what Jesus has done for you. That's why you've come to church today. Let's celebrate who he is and what he's accomplished. May our faces light up. What makes your face light up? How often do you smile? Let's see some smiles in church. I'm looking at you. May your heart be lifted up. May your face light up for all that God is for us. And Jesus, may we exult in his greatness. It's officially the Christmas season. As I said, it's common in historic Christian church to focus during the Christmas season on the virtue of Jesus, you know, what he's like in his character. And this Christmas season, we're taking five weeks to focus on the virtue of joy. Last week, we noted the difference between happiness and and joy, and that everlasting joy is found in Jesus. He taught his disciples that through a parable of a treasure hidden in a field, that he is the source of joy, and that we find, as human beings, we find true joy, everlasting joy, in recognizing his value, surrendering all of our life to him, giving all of our life for him, And trusting, expecting that the next life with him after his resurrection, after our resurrection in him, is the best life when he returns. So if you're miserable in life, or if you're fighting misery, the solution is to turn to Jesus. What do you have to lose? You have everything to gain. So give Jesus the try, the benefit of the doubt. Go to him for joy. You'll find it in him. Today, we turn our attention to see some even more direct instructions from Jesus about how to rejoice, what to rejoice specifically about in him. So please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 17 through 24. Luke is not hard to find, really. It's the third book in the New Testament. And if you don't have a Bible, the verses will be on the screen for you to read. It's Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 24. Last Sunday, Jesus taught us about joy and having joy in him as a person, as a being through a parable. This week, he teaches us to have joy and rejoice in what he has done. So there's joy in who he is and there's joy in what he's done. Look at four things 
that Jesus has achieved for our benefit. And let's rejoice in it with our voices and in our hearts. He's done this for us, for every one of us. Four instructions from our Lord, what to celebrate. First, rejoice in the power we have in his name. So delight in the authority that he's given every single Christian on the planet. Appreciate the strength he has, we have in him. Look at verses 17 through 19 in Luke chapter 10. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. So Jesus, after he began his public ministry at about the age of, of 30 years old, he called 12 men to be his disciples, his first disciples. In Luke chapter 9, the chapter before what we just read, in Luke chapter 9, it records how he sent those 12 out to preach the gospel in the towns of Israel. It was 12 men for the 12 tribes of Israel. It was very symbolic. And they returned home in chapter 9 and reported to him with great joy that the demons even were subject to his name. They had so much power and authority in preaching the gospel. Because of all of that ministry that happened, so many people started following Jesus. One day, he had to feed 5,000 of them on a hillside. Because so many people gathered because of all that was going on. And he did a miracle with some loaves and some fish to feed all those people. And perhaps it was some of the men from that crowd that day on the hillside that he selected to be sent out Again, in this group that we read about in Luke chapter 10, he sent out those disciples as well to preach the gospel. It's possible that those men corresponded to Genesis chapter 10 when it describes all the nations of the world. That's certainly possible. It could have been that Jesus sent out the 12 first to the 12 tribes of Israel, and then later he sent out all these men to represent all the nations on the the earth, his gospel is for everyone. And he was getting at that symbolically with who he sent out. We don't know for sure. What we do know that for sure is that the men in chapter 10 came back with the same report as the men in chapter 9 came back with. They had power in Jesus' name. And it gave them great joy. They were like, yes. Our son John had a birthday this week, 26 years old. When he was six years old, I was his soccer coach. Now, I noticed after the first game, I analyzed what happened, didn't really know what was going to happen. You guys ever coached five or six-year-olds in soccer? So I, I, I experienced it, and I noticed that the kids would move around in a crowd around the ball. Wherever the ball went, the crowd went. You know, like bees to honey, it was a uh, you're, you're watching a six-year-old soccer game right now. <laughs> you are. This is what it is. And that observation, the first game, gave me, a, I think, a genius coaching insight. Before the second game, I told a few kids who I know would listen. John was one of them. I said, hey, don't run towards the ball. In fact, I want you to run away from the ball. And they all looked at me puzzled, like you're looking at me right now. But what I did was the most powerful strategy in that league in Indiana. What happened? Crowd followed the ball. And then all of a sudden, these couple kids darted away. And the ball would then all of a sudden be kicked where? Away. And as the crowd went to go follow it, there was a kid wide open who got the ball and then started kicking it and scored easily. We crushed that team. <laughs> and every team after. Undefeated. And you should have seen the look on the kids' faces when they came back to the huddle after they scored a goal. We let 
different kids, everybody take a turn in this strategy so that every kid got the joy. I scored. They ran back to the, to the huddle and they gave me glory for what happened. They said, coach, this works. This works. And we all sort of like jumped up and down. I think it was a bit like that with the disciples, don't you? So they went out and preached the gospel. They experienced the power of it. They came back with great joy. They gave Jesus the glory. It was in his name. They said, Jesus, this worked. It worked. Even the demons submit to us in your name. So Jesus gave them offensive power to take down the greatest evil in the world, to beat it. That word Satan, you see there, literally means accuser. Satan appears a couple times in the scriptures, in Job and Zechariah in the Old Testament. He appears in the heavenly council of God with all the angels, and he's the public prosecutor for sin. He's the accuser. He also appeared in Luke chapter 4 earlier in this, what we're looking at, chapter 10. He appeared in chapter 4 when he tempted uh, Jesus. But his first appearance is way back in the Garden of Eden as a serpent, where he led the first people into sin. And after he did that, Genesis 3.15 is so wonderful. It records the first gospel prophecy that a descendant of Eve, the seed of Eve, the descendant of Eve will crush the head of the serpent, foretelling Jesus. And that's what's being fulfilled right here in Luke chapter 10. Jesus was crushing the head of the devil and his minions, the scorpions, through, get this, the ministry of his disciples, these regular guys. He gave them offensive power. And do you notice too, he gave them defensive power? Verse 19 reads, don't you love this? Nothing shall hurt you. So no matter what happened to these men, the evil in the world couldn't harm them because Jesus transformed their situation such that even their death would be gain for them. They would enter glory afterwards. So these guys come back from their mission. They got joy. They're like, yes. They celebrated. They rejoiced. And Jesus, did you see that there? Jesus rejoiced with them. Like I did with the kids, you know? Yeah. You scored. Woo. Love it. Is that hard for you to picture? Is that what your Jesus is like? I wonder if us, some of us have a wrong view of God. Like he's this very stoic, somber God. It's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus is God in the flesh. God is the most joyful being in the universe. Jesus is the source of joy. So Jesus overflows with joy. Jesus is so full of joy, he's overflowing with it. He has enough for the billions of people all over the planet to fill our hearts so that we sing to him, right? And he wants us to rejoice first in the power of his name, it says. He wants you to delight in his forgiveness of your sin. He wants, to be, he wants you to be like, yes, I'm forgiven. Power. That's power in his name. Satan is the accuser. He's the forgiver. He wants us to celebrate that. He wants you to delight in the fact that you can share the gospel and other people can experience that same power, that same forgiveness of their sin, that offensive power to rejoice that devils get taken down and sin gets for forgiven and shame is healed and hurts are restored. He wants you to have so much joy that the world can't even harm you. He wants you to have joy, Christian, that your destiny is everlasting life. That's the power in his name. Your home is with him. Four instructions from our Lord about what to celebrate. First, rejoice in his power, the power of his name. Second, rejoice in the security of your salvation. Oh, do you have some delight here, don't you? In the permanence of your relationship with Jesus. So exult in the fact that you're saved because of his faithfulness not because of your faithfulness. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Nevertheless, 
Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. All right? So this may appear, though, actually, that Jesus is sort of rebuking his disciples and saying, hey, don't rejoice in that. It may appear that way. Don't rejoice that you have power in my name. I, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what's going on here. They were basically just sort of jumping up and down together, right? And Jesus was leading the, the dance of joy in what was going on. It would be weird for him to all of a sudden just turn and just scold them. You know, a furrowed brow. He's smiling. He's happy. So the way it's written here, the way Jesus spoke, was a way of emphasizing the importance of one thing over another. It was it was common. It's kind of proverbial in the ancient world. So the phrase you see there, do not rejoice, that wasn't a prohibition against rejoicing. Rather, it was saying, it was prioritizing one kind of rejoicing over another kind of rejoicing. They all had this joy of defeating Satan and the demonic world, the deliverance of, sin, uh, of sinners from, from sin. And as they settled down from that celebration, they're like, oh, you know, they settled down from it. Jesus instructed them to have more joy in something else. That joy's great, but hey, don't rejoice just in that. Like, there's more joy for you, and it's in the security of your salvation. So as much as the party started, it should increase with greater intensity, far greater. In other words, rejoice more in Jesus' work to make you a child of God than his power through you to defeat evil. Rejoice more in his saving grace than your spiritual gifts. Rejoice more in what Jesus has done for you than what he does through you. The latter is worthy of celebration, right? More than the former. For as powerful as evil is in the world, and as a, isn't it a great joy when you see evil defeated? You know, you're like, yes! Greatest power, though, evil, power is death itself. And hell that follows. And so the greatest joy must be the defeat of, of death itself and of hell that follows. Not just defeated in general like some theoretical thing, but defeated for you. He defeated death and hell for you, for us. That's where the joy is, he says. That's the greatest joy. Because if you have all the power in the world to defeat all the evil in the world, but you don't have enough power to defeat death and hell that follows, what ultimate joy is there in that? We'd all be miserable. So Jesus instructs us here, rejoice the most in his defeat of death and hell on our behalf. That's what that wonderful phrase, you see it there, your names are written in heaven. That's what that means. So that phrase is written there in the perfect tense. Meaning, God himself wrote your name, and it's permanent. But it's not just Greek grammar and a verse that teaches us that. The concept of God securing a place for all of us who put our faith in his son Jesus, securing a place for us in eternity, that's taught in many places in the Bible. And God portraying that reality in the form of a book, where he writes names in that book, is also located many places in the Bible. It's in Exodus, Daniel, Hebrews, and Revelation. It's called the book of life. And everyone who has faith in Jesus has their name written in that book by God himself. Don't you love that? It's, it doesn't matter how small your faith is or how weak your faith is. You ever feel weak in faith? Right? It doesn't matter how small. It doesn't matter how weak. It just matters if you have some faith, even a little bit of faith, the scripture says. Even if you have a little bit of faith, God himself writes your name in the book of life. And, and that, that signature from God is permanent. Every name in that book has been forgiven of their sin. Every name in that book has been given the power to turn from sin, to defeat it in our own lives. Every name in that book will one day be delivered from the presence of sin. Every name in that book has been saved from sin and its consequences forever. Every name in that book has defeated death, even though we have not yet met death, we've already defeated it. Every name in that book is destined for heaven, not hell. And every name in that book is in permanent ink. 
Nothing is more secure than your name. Nothing is more secure in the universe than your name, Christian, written in God's book. You know why? Because you didn't write it there. God did. Your works didn't wield that pen. God's work in Jesus composed every single stroke. And you can't get up there and erase it. You can't white it out. Your sins and failures can't remove your name. No other being can. No other human can. Not even the devil himself can. God wrote it and God keeps it. And our role is to celebrate it. Amen? Four instructions from Jesus about what to rejoice in. First, rejoice in the power we have in his name. Second, rejoice most of all in the security of our salvation. Third, rejoice in the grace of his revelation. So Jesus revealed himself to you, to us, and he did so without regard to what you uh, deserved. He didn't, you didn't have to earn his approval. Look at Luke chapter 10, verses 21 through 22. Notice the theme of joy that continues. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This is remarkable. Jesus rejoiced with his disciples about the results of their mission. He rejoiced, you know, he's rejoicing with them about their names being written in heaven most. And the language used here in this prayer to describe his rejoicing about how he was revealed to them is stunning. This is the only place in the New Testament where this word is used to describe Jesus' emotion. The only place. It means exultation, thrilled. He was beside himself with joy, our Lord. A couple weeks ago, we flew to Chicago to be there when our son Matt proposed to his girlfriend, Becky. We were in downtown Crystal Lake, Illinois, right near the gazebo where they had their first kiss. So romantic. We were hiding behind the bushes. I had to get really low. Taller guy with a bald head, didn't want to see the head. And Matt and Becky walked up. We had it all recorded. They walked up to the gazebo, which was decorated mainly by her folks, but also we we chipped into decorations as well. He got down on one knee. He popped the question. He presented the ring. She was overjoyed, as was he. I've never seen a bigger smile on my son's face than this moment. She was the same. She said yes. Both of them beside themselves with joy. In that moment, and then through the entire evening as we went on and celebrated, it was joy so intense, it was hard to describe. A thrilling moment in their lives. Now, the context here in this scripture isn't a romantic one, but that's the word. That's the word. That's what Jesus was experiencing, that kind of joy. It means exultation, thrilling. He was beside himself with inner delight. And why? Well, I think some people read these verses, come to the exact opposite conclusion of what they actually mean. Some people erroneously think that verse 22 means Jesus' identity as Savior and Lord would have been known plainly to all, but yet he restricted it. You know, he, he said, oh, I'm just going to reveal it to a select few. Like he was the restrictor. When in fact, that was exactly the awful practice of the religious leaders of the day that Jesus himself condemned. He hated that. That was a miserable practice. You know, those religious leaders, the Pharisees and others, they thought they were the wise and understanding. They were the pompous ones. They were the arrogant ones, and they taught that God only revealed himself to people like them, you know? 
People who were super religious, who had rules upon rules upon rules upon rules upon rules that they could only, only they could follow, thereby leaving out everyone else. They thought they were the only ones who had access to God with all of their education, doctorate upon doctorate upon doctorate about theology and all this stuff. Only they could know God. That left out all the ordinary people from being able to know God. So Jesus was beside himself with joy, it says. He was thrilled, not because he restricted knowing God to just a few. That was the Pharisees. No, he was thrilled because through him, God was opening the doors wide open to all the little people in the world. The ordinary, the regular, the common, the sinners, the humble. That's what he meant by little children there. It's the simple disciples who just had faith. They didn't have any credentials, those disciples. They had the opposite of credentials. So Jesus is thrilled with the grace of God that God reveals himself to these people without regard to their worthiness. And in doing so, his identity is then hidden from the self-righteous, from the self-centered, from the pompous, from the arrogant. And it's hidden because of their own sin. See, it's through Jesus and Jesus only that people come to know who the Father is. And Jesus himself reveals to people that he is the Lord and Savior by grace through faith. That's his good news. And he instructs all of us to rejoice in that. The power we have in his name, the security of our salvation, and this grace of his revelation. Fourth and finally, Jesus tells us, he instructs us to rejoice in the privilege of our position. So to delight in the honor that we have as Christians. The place where we sit in history. Look at Luke 10, 23 through 24. Then, turning to the disciples, he said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. See that exclamation point there? He's still got joy. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So Jesus sent out these disciples on a mission, preached the gospel in all these various towns. They come back. They're like, yes, like those little kids came back after scoring a goal. Like, yes, it worked. They submit in your name, Jesus. They rejoiced. And then he said, hey, rejoice even more in the, in the great joy that your names are written in heaven. And then he said, he re, and then the scripture says he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit that these guys, God's revealing himself uh, to them. These sinners are putting faith in him. And then right after that, it, it reads that he looked towards heaven in a joyful prayer. And then he turned to his disciples. So his, his joy continued. I think when you read this Eight verses you should picture, if you can, in your mind's eye, Jesus with a smile on his face the whole time. I mean, he is joyful about all of it. And he turns to them to describe what's been happening with a smile. And he says, guys, can you believe what you get to experience? I mean, prophets wanted to experience this for centuries upon centuries. They wanted to see the Messiah in person. They didn't. Kings did too, but they didn't get that privilege. Guys, here you are, fishermen, right? Tax collectors, farmers, laborers, nobodies in flyover country. And you're walking with the Son of God. You're serving the Son of God. You're sharing the victory of the Son of God. It's hard to, I mean, it's hard to overstate that privilege, isn't it? That they had the privilege of their position. They're blessed beyond measure. And Jesus was celebrating that blessing with them. He loved it. He rejoiced in it. He wanted them to rejoice too. And though we certainly don't have the privilege they had, you know, we haven't seen Jesus face to face. You want, I wonder what he looked like, don't you, sometimes? We haven't heard audibly his human vocal cords speak. I wonder what he sounded like. Wouldn't that have been amazing to hear God speak? We haven't experienced those things. Well, that's true. 
Isn't the position that we hold quite privileged, though? You know, in John 16, Jesus said it was to our advantage. He meant the, the followers of his in that time, but also us now. It's to our advantage, all Christians' advantage, that he would leave after the resurrection and ascend to the throne of the universe. Why? Because he poured out his spirit then, and he would be with his people, all of his people, dwelling in our hearts. So we haven't seen Jesus face to face, but the spirit dwells here. He's here. Prophets and kings wanted to experience the Holy Spirit in this way. In ancient times, they didn't. Do you know Moses prayed for this? Moses cried out for this, that he would experience the Holy Spirit in the way that you experience the Holy Spirit. And God didn't answer Moses yes for himself. He answered Moses yes for us. Isn't that incredible? And in 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter points out the privilege of our position according to Jesus. Apostle Peter wrote that he walked with Jesus, he heard Jesus' audible voice, but the scriptures were better than that experience. Peter said that. Because when he heard Jesus' audible voice, and then Jesus went on to heaven, he could no doubt have doubts, right? All he had was his memory. Did Jesus really say? That's why the Bible's way better than our memories. The scripture is God's voice in our hands. We can confidently proclaim, he really did say. I'm looking at it. Old Testament prophets and kings, they wanted to see and hear Jesus in person. They, they wanted to also read the New Testament as well, but they didn't. That's the privilege of our position, according to Peter. Are you getting this? We can read the entire written word of God. Blessed are the eyes that see what we see. Blessed are the ears that hear what we hear. Do you know how rare it is to be able to read the entire word of God in your own language? You know how rare that is on the, on the planet and in human history? We can pull up 72 versions on our iPhone. I mean, the privilege of our position, it's hard to overstate it. And if you want to hear God's voice out loud, all you have to do is read the Bible out loud. Correct? It's not your voice. This is his words. You want to hear from him? Verbally? Just read that. Read it out loud. Blessed are the ears that hear what we hear. And Jesus instructs all of us to rejoice in what he's done in this regard. So to rejoice in the power we have in his name and the security of our salvation and the grace of his revelation and the privilege of our position. Well, in this Bible, there are 31,000 verses. Uh, it's commonly asserted, I think you've probably heard this, maybe you haven't, that the shortest verse of the 31,000 is John eleven thirty five, 35, which states, Jesus wept. Two words, wonderful, profound truth, Jesus wept. But did you know, while that verse is two words in English, it's actually three words in the original language? So I'm here to tell you today, I know some of you guys like these really interesting data points in the, in the Bible. Technically, it's not the shortest verse in the Bible. There is a shorter one. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, which is two words in both the original language and the English translation of it. Do you know what it is? Rejoice always, right? Shortest verse in the Bible. And it's pretty cool as we come to a time of communion here shortly with Pastor Mark leading us in that to reflect on how these two shortest verses in the Bible are connected. Think about it. Jesus wept so that we would rejoice always. The God who's overflowing with joy took on our sorrows on earth so that we would overflow with eternal joy in heaven. He died in our place so that we would celebrate him forevermore. Let's pray. Oh, our Father in heaven, we praise you as the holy God that you are. Oh, who are we? That you would even listen to us. We thank you for the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus 
that in what he has done, we are able to talk to you. In what he has done, that we are able to even make you smile. That you find delight in us. Oh, how marvelous this is to our ears as we think about it. And Lord, we confess that, you know, we want to be joyful, but sometimes it's hard. We're fighting misery. Help us, we pray. We confess too, Lord, that sometimes we, we have a wrong view of you. We're picturing you as a stern, harsh God with a furrowed brow instead of a savior with a smiling face. Help us to think rightly of you and rejoice in all that you've done for us in Jesus. Help us to behold who you truly are, even as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand, let's worship together.
You may be seated. I want you to take out your cup if you've got one from the elders who were at the door earlier or one of the ushers gave you one. Is anybody here still needing a cup? They don't have one and one of the ushers will help you out. Looks like everybody's got one. We're so glad that you're here today. We're so glad to have you online. If um, if you've got your elements at home, you can partake with us this morning. Um, you know, If you don't have them next month and you know you're going to be at home, why don't you stop by the office? We'll be glad to give you one in preparation to be able to participate with us. So glad to have you all online. So glad to have everyone here today. You know, uh, what, what Pastor Scott said is so true. I, I really appreciate that, that message because, you know, I... I wrote down some thoughts on the back of my We Care card here. And um, the fact is, is that God reveals it to us. Remember the day when all of a sudden it dawned on you. It wasn't just dawning on you. It was God speaking to you. That's how God does that. And then on top of that, we rejoice in that it, it's beyond measure. You, you know the apostles on the night in which Jesus was betrayed and they took communion together. The apostles are sitting there wondering, what's he talking about? You know, he's going to die. He's going to... What, what's he, we don't get it yet. You know, they, don't, they didn't understand it for a few days because until Jesus came back, they, they thought it was over. It was history. And instead, um, Jesus reveals it to them and the power of his resurrection. And so um, it, God brings it to them beyond their wildest dreams and then their name written in the book of life. Oh, wow, secured in there. It can't be removed. It, it, can't be taken away, God says in John chapter 8. Nothing can be taken out of the Father's hand. And then the power of rejoicing in it all. We rejoice because we can remember, as the passage in 1 Corinthians 11 says regarding communion, is we're to take this in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. Some of you are here this morning, and I'm going to target some people. <laughs> you think, uh-oh, in trouble. Uh, I'm going to tar target our younger people today. Perhaps you're sitting here, a high schooler or a college student, and you're just beginning to go out there on your own in life, and you're thinking, what should I do with life here? Um, it's to follow Christ. I want to challenge you now. If you don't know Christ as Savior, maybe you're a first-time guest here, second, third, maybe you've been here a year, and you have not decided to trust in Christ as Savior, because that's what it is. It's not trusting in yourself anymore. It's trusting in what Christ did for us on the cross that saves us from our sins. Not taking communion. We take communion remember what he's done for us. And so right now, I'm going to give you a chance to bow your head. If you're a young person, if you're an older person, and you haven't received Christ as Savior, why don't you do it right now? And you can take communion with us, saying, I know Christ, I'll do it in remembrance of what he did for me, and I rejoice in the Lord. And if you're a believer, and you know, you haven't been walking with God properly, you got some obstacles in the way right now between you and God. Maybe it's in a relationship, maybe it's at work, maybe it's at home, maybe it's just something in life bugging you really bad and it's blocking your relationship with God. I want to give you a moment to pray about that and simply say, God, I give it to you. Take it from me because I can't take it. You just do it and forgive me for any part I had in it. And Lord, let's walk together strongly. Take a moment, bow your head in prayer and just call upon the Lord, whatever that is in the need this morning. I want you to take the bread out, and if you've never had communion with us before, we take this at the same time together. So if you'll hold off a minute, take the bread out of the out of the container, the cup, and you know it says the night in which he was betrayed, he got together with his disciples. They took the bread together, and Jesus blessed it. So I want to ask a blessing, Father God. We thank you for Christ who gave His life for us. He was beaten, He was bruised, He was abused, He was mocked, He was scorned, He was shamed. And it says in Philippians, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even a death on a cross for us. As a church, Father, we thank you. We 
gather together to take this together and give you the praise and ask you to bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. It says he took the bread, he blessed it, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We take the cup and we flip it over the other side with the juice in it. We ask God's blessing upon this too. Father, we're mindful that it's the blood of the Lamb, God Old Testament one, who covered their sins, but Jesus does more than covering sins. He removes our sins from east to from west, cancels out all of our iniquity. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for this blood that was shed for us and this remembrance in this moment when we can reflect upon that. We ask you to bless this cup in remembrance. In Jesus' name, amen. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. Well, wow, what a great day it's been, huh? Amen? What a great message too, right? What musicians God has given us. Wow. What a church. What a church. What a church. I thank God for it. Why don't you stand with me as we prepare to go and we're gonna, I'm gonna pray for you. But in the meantime, Pastor Scott and his wife will be out in the atrium and they would love to say hello to you. If you've never met them before, take a moment and do that. And our prayer teams will be down here today. They would love to pray with you over any th matter that you've got. Uh, I'll be down here too. And if you'd like to say, hey, pastor, I just trusted in Christ as my savior. I'm gonna pray for you. So you, you come down. And if, if you still never received Christ as savior, I'd like to pray with you about that too. So glad to have you here today. If you've got an offering today, you drop it off in the boxes on the door. And if you haven't filled out your week card yet, a uh, week care card, you can fill that out if you haven't cheated and filled out other stuff on it. But uh, take the week care card and let us know that you are here today. Put your name on it. And if you're a first time guest, please stop in the atrium. They have a special gift for you today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with us online as well. We hope that one day you'll be able to join us here in the service as well. Let's pray as we prepare to leave. Father, thank you for your love for us, the joy that we have, uh, the, oh wow, such joy in our hearts because we're forgiven, because Christ is our Savior, because you've come to us and touched our hearts, our lives. There are 3.2 million people on this island, Lord, who need Jesus. I pray you'd burden us to go out and tell them what Jesus has done for us this week. God, move in our hearts. Thank you for the way you've blessed us we seek your face as we go out this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you go.